Hey there, everyone. It is Denise Salcedo. Once again, I have literally been dropping so many interviews on this channel, but I cannot tell you how excited I am for today's guest because today I am joined by Speedball Mike Bailey. What's up, Mike? Hello, happy to be here. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good. I kind of mentioned this off air to you, but when you said yes to doing this interview, I was like, hell yeah. I cannot wait to talk to him because honestly, I'll just kind of start off with this. You know, uh, seeing you at Hard to Kill at Impact Wrestling, that match with Ace Austin and Chris Bay and Laredo Kid was absolutely phenomenal, literally knocked my socks off. And when I kind of like learned a little bit more about your story, like I couldn't wait to talk to you about it. Well, thank you so much. I'm happy you bring up that hard to kill match because that was definitely quite a way to make my impact debut. So I'm I'm super happy. I feel blessed that it went down that way. And uh, thank you for bringing it up. You're like, thank God, like all the stars aligned and everything right? worked out great. You know, especially when a match like that, when you're moving at such a fast pace and you got all these guys doing all of these insane moves. Like, let's be real. Like, you know, things can happen. Things can be botched or whatever. But no, this was like a crisp and entertaining matchup. Like, really enjoyed it. Yes. And it's a bit it's a big debut. It's a big deal for me. It's, it's my first first match back in the U.S. after almost six years. It's my Impact debut, which is now my home for the next uh, several several years. Lord knows how long. And so it has to be good. Hell and yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm usually good at giving myself some leeway. At being, you know, things might go wrong. It won't be perfect, <laughs> but it's going to be fine. You can always, you know, do it better again later. But no, there I was, I was zoned in. I was focused. The pressure was on. So I'm glad it went well. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, obviously, you know, your first match back in the United States, Impact Wrestling, you mentioned you want to make, you want to make a, you know, re establish yourself as somebody to be, you know, to keep an eye out on here on Impact Wrestling. Uh, what were your emotions heading into this match? And how did you feel coming out of it? So I am in a weird position when it comes to the U.S. I mean, especially on uh independent bookings that I've taken over the last few weeks, I've had a, a mixed reaction of people that like know who I am, have followed my, my work over the last few years and are just happy to see me and excited. And then there's a lot of people, which is, you know, at some of the shows was the majority of the audience is like, Oh, we've never seen this guy. Why are people so excited? So it's a weird spot to be in where there people don't know you, but also there are expectations uh, you sort of have to deliver. And uh, I I felt that way at Impact where uh, they, you know, I got a full entrance and I got a video and I was, you know, put in a match with people that were well-established former X Division champion. Ace Austin was there and there's, there's pressure. People are like, okay, this guy, he appears to be a big deal. And then I have to go and, and deliver on that. And, you know, fantastic. Got the win made it happen and uh, excited to see what comes next. I love that. And we'll talk more about Impact Wrestling in just a hot second. But I will like full disclosure, you know, when I saw you at Impact Wrestling, that was really my introduction to you. So I'm on like the second half of the fans where it's like, you know, I'm getting to see him like work for the first time. And then like immediately afterwards, you know, I went and kind of learned a little bit more about you, more about your story. And I was in I was very fascinated. And also, I kind of had this thing where I was so happy that you got the win because, you know, just from like an outsider's perspective, I was like, dude, like this must mean like so much to him to be able to like get to have this opportunity. So let's kind of rewind a little bit back and uh, let's circle back to uh, 2016. Uh, this That's when the Wrestling Observer essentially reported that uh, you had unfortunately been banned from the United States after you were coming in uh, because you were trying to make a booking at Evolved and that ended up costing you uh, due to visa issues uh, getting out of the country for you said what five, six years now. Um, kind of walk us through that story and kind of give us, you know, like the details on what went down and kind of like what your mindset was when all of that essentially went down well so the details are pretty boring um it's uh but no it, it is it, i mean it's just you know visa and immigration stuff you know that did not work out in my favor but i was picking up some momentum in the u.s um things were going very well again pwg evolved czw i was you know i was starting to make my name which was very lucky uh in the in the timing in which things happened i was starting to make my name and then 
of course, I, I found out I wouldn't be able to enter the U.S. for five years, um, which is, of course, a big deal because you assume that things are going to go a certain way for your wrestling career. You know, PWG and then a lot of people with whom I wrestled at PWG uh, during, you know, in 2015-16 ended up be going to NXT shortly thereafter or uh, or Impact back then. Um and that's sort of what I was hoping would would happen with myself as well. And then once you know oh, that's not going to happen, the trajectory that you had made for yourself is not going to work out at all. I mean, you know, you have two options, basically. I can just quit. I can stop. I can just take the L and move on to something else with my career and just, you know, let pro wrestling go. Or I can figure out another way to make a to, to become a successful pro wrestler outside of the united states outside of the place where everyone wants to be which of course um forced me to look at you know europe shortly after i was banned i still i did some shows in canada and then um rev pro i think uh if you're familiar with them they're based out of london in the uk they're one of the best promotions in england they're uh closely affiliated with new japan um they were one of the first ones to bring me in for like an extended tour as well as wxw in germany soon after and then uh, I got to wrestle for DDT through a connection that I had made at an Evolve show um, in the U.S. And I DDT was really my home for uh, from 2016 to 2020, up until, right up until the pandemic. And I, I would have been back there if it wasn't for uh, the pandemic making things so difficult. But yeah, uh, DDT became my home and I, I was able to you know, earn a living and grow as a pro wrestler outside of the U.S. And my mission was really to keep as much momentum as I could going up until the end of my five-year inadmissibility, which is, you know, when I could finally make some moves with some of the world's biggest companies and uh, eventually landing me an impact contract, which I'm thrilled about. And let's kind of like you, like, I'm so glad that you mentioned all of this because it's really interesting to see like, you know, how you essentially, like you mentioned, you had two options, you either quit, you stop, or you figure out a way. Uh, But that's not something that's easy to do, especially because we're talking about this time period where if you legitimately want to make uh, wrestling a full-time career and you want to be a star and you want to make real money and, you know, not have to work, shoot job and all of that other stuff, you got to be wrestling for somebody like WWE. Like you got to be there. You got to be making that money there. So for you and you got to be in the united states so for you like getting that notice of hey you're banned from the country it's like sweeping a rug underneath from you it's like kind of like taking you know it really is like taking your opportunities away so like was it easy for you during this time period to be like all right well this is what i'm gonna do or were you like sort of struggling trying to figure out a way of like hey what's my plan b here yeah i mean uh also, this was several years ago. If it happened now, it would be completely different. I feel like uh, it's a lot easier to make a living as an independent wrestler now, even without a company, given all the options you have for content creation and, you know, being your own brand, which I think is super important, and even for people who are under contract. But that was really, we, you didn't have the chugs in uh, 20, 2016. So I couldn't just look at that and go, oh, I could maybe I could do that. But no, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, it it was starting a little bit. You had the like the cruiserweight classic. I think was a big moment for that. And when you had guys like uh, Zack Saber Jr., who was like one of the first guys when it was still a big deal to turn down a WWE contract to go to to New Japan, and like seeing things like that were happening more and more, sort of was pretty inspiring for me, honestly, to, to, to be in that position and see, okay, maybe this is not the end all be all. There are other options. There are people who are pursuing different tracks and it's working out extremely well for them. So maybe I could do that as well, which I mean, kind of did. <laughs> I was going to say like in a way, because you kind of figure out like a different route that you're going, you know, your career went a different route. And, you know, you mentioned going to Europe and going to Japan and all of that in a way, do you kind of think, and I don't know the, if you feel this way, but uh, was this a blessing in disguise? So you are certainly not the first person to, to bring that up. So it's something that I've gotten a chance to think a lot about. And it's like, it's a big, what if, and it's super hard to tell on one hand, like yeah, things I'm I'm absolutely blessed 
and cannot complain about the way things are now. I'm so happy with the path my career has gone. I've had experiences wrestling, you know, all around the world that I might not have had otherwise. On the other hand, what if I did go to the Cruiserweight Classic? Things went super well, got hired, spent five years in WWE, decided to quit with a million Twitter followers and just had the option to do whatever I had. That would be pretty neat as well. However, uh, I could have also, you know, not gotten bad, done a PWG show the next month and broke my neck. And that's another <laughs> possible scenario. So, I mean, I, that's why I struggle with hypotheticals. It yeah. could be, it, it, yes, I'm happy with the way things are. Definitely could be a blessing in this guy. That is absolutely possible. However, could also the other way could also be much better. It's nuts because you're like, oh, well, this could have happened. This could have happened. Like, oh, my God, I'm missing out on all these amazing things. But then it's right. Like, well, things could have possibly not have been amazing for you. Right. But uh, so it is an interesting, you know, topic to kind of touch on. Uh, so I do want to ask because we're talking about the Cruiserweight Classic. We're talking about, you know, the what ifs and all of that. Uh, did you ever uh, either before getting banned or even afterwards, uh, were you ever like, in route to possibly be signing with WWE? Were there conversations there? How close, uh, if that happened, did did it happen for you? Not in any concrete way. You know, of course, like like I said, a lot of people that I was with in PWG were, were getting signed. And like in 2016, I, I knew a lot of people there. And there were like discussions, but there kind of always are. You know, you always hear rumblings and I never know how much of that is true. So that's always a weird thing. I've heard people say that people have said that someone said that they were definitely going to sign me. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I don't know how I don't know how much that's worth. It's kind of crazy, though, don't you think? Like if you're hearing somebody saying like, oh, somebody's saying something about this, that I'm going to be signed with this person. And you're like, what? Like, how are these conversations going on about my life that I don't know about? So it is uh, my, my first big pro wrestling trip was when I went to uh, Mexico for two months with AAA. And it was uh, the, the promoter for the IBS who told me, oh, uh, Conan sent me a message. He really wants you to come to AAA. And that was like, that was my first big trip. I was, you know, mostly just kind of doing stuff here and there, nothing, nothing big. And AAA is a major company. That was a big opportunity. And my first reaction when I heard that was definitely, oh, okay, we'll see. Doesn't sound like, but then, you know, then it worked out. So I guess that was good. But you hear so much, uh, you hear people say so much that then doesn't work out. So you kind of learn to, you know, listen make a note and then go back to it if it turns into anything. But I mean, you hear a lot, so it's difficult. That's so crazy to me. Like you always think that like when you hear these stories of, hey, this person was, you know, very close to signing with WWE, you're like, well, whoa, what do you mean by that? Like how exactly did this uh, essentially come about? Uh, so let's go ahead and kind of talk about, uh, you know, we mentioned now that you're you're with Impact Wrestling, you know, things are, you know, starting to, you know, start to, you're starting to build up on all of this stuff. So for you, like how did, it, what did it mean to you to like sign with Impact Wrestling and to be able to like get this opportunity to show, you know, the, I guess you can say like more of the American audience, you know, kind of what they hadn't been seeing from you. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like I was in a great position again with with pressure, but also coming into Impact Wrestling, not as someone who needs to, to you know, still learn the ropes, but as, as a fully polished, uh, you know, 15 year professional wrestler and just that I'm going to go there and I'm going to I'm going to do good. I'm going to, I'm going to rock things over there and I'm going to let them know who I am and I'm going to, uh, no pun intended, make an impact. So, I mean, there was nothing, there's never been any doubt in my mind that I'm going to do great at impact. It's going to be a good deal and things are going to work out, but there's also a lot behind the contract on top of uh, everything that, you know, uh, meant a lot to me. Like, for example, just the, the fact that I was able to come back to the United States and just, you know, uh, go over that, go over that part, which has happened to a lot of wrestlers and, and, you know, killed their, killed their careers just means a lot. Um, there's also the, the life stuff, uh, about being able to physically enter the U S which is where my, uh, fiance Veda Scott lives. And we had been together for, you know, a few years at that point and our life mostly revolved around, tours and finding work together we were in uh europe together and in japan together and we were constantly going back and forth between you know canada europe and japan while she was also wrestling in the u.s and we 
had been wanting to, you know, live together for a long time. And we spent the first few years of our relationship not knowing if that would ever really be a possibility to be to be in the U.S. together, which is where uh, their family lives or if we'd have if they'd have to move to a different country somewhere else, you know, maybe Canada, maybe not and figure that out. But the ideal plan, plan A was always, you know, for me to get a visa and then us to be able to live together in the U.S. and wrestle and travel together, which is something we wanted to do for a long time. And signing with Impact meant that I would be able to do that. Uh, and on top of wrestling for a great company, that really meant a lot to me. So it's kind of crazy. Like, it's just like everything in your life was impacted, you know, your romantic life, your career life, and just everything that sort of changed with that. Uh, you know, signing with Impact Wrestling, what kind of conversations uh, did you have with Scott Demore in terms of like the direction that they might want to go with you? And just like in terms of like, you know, why he personally wanted to, you know, bring you on to Impact Wrestling? In terms of uh, what he wanted to do, like creatively and all that, we really had no conversations. Um, I trust Scott. If there's one thing I know about Scott is he knows good wrestling. And I just look at the path that like a Josh Alexander has had in impact and, you know, uh, much like me, except from a very different path. But he came in with nothing to learn, but only things to show. And uh, he's done fantastic. And I look at what Impact has done with so many talents over the last few years. And I didn't need to have that discussion, really. That's so cool. Like, honestly, I, I like kind of just seeing like what you were able to do like instantly right now like with Impact Wrestling I think it's going to be exciting like how you continue to grow upon that and so I'm going to ask you you know the question that I think like everybody asked but I gotta know like who are some of the people that you're just like dang I cannot wait to get in the ring with this person and wrestle this person in Impact Wrestling yeah I mean Josh Josh Alexander of course is um I I was signed directly after a match with him at Destiny in Canada where uh the Scott literally got into the ring after the, the match to offer me a contract. And that was, I think the maybe third or fourth singles match I had with Josh Alexander throughout my career over the last few years, which are all fantastic. And it would mean so much to me to finally get to do that again, but on a much bigger stage at impact wrestling. Um, if not, you know, the X division champion, Trey Miguel is someone that way before over the last, like over the years I've seen wrestle and I followed his career and is definitely amazing. And one of the guys that I know, we could really do something special uh, in the ring. Um, Jordan Grace, I think. Uh, Impact Wrestling does a lot of intergender wrestling, which I think is absolutely fantastic. But Jordan Grace is really someone that I admire um, for not only what they do in the ring, but everything they do outside and building up her own personal brand and how she's done that is absolutely amazing and definitely a model for all working pro wrestlers right now. Oh my God, I would absolutely love to see that, by the way. Like the second you mentioned Jordan Grace, I was like, hell yeah. You know, that's definitely something that I didn't expect, but it's a great answer because I think like, you know, you mentioned the intergender wrestling matches and, you know, Impact Wrestling has always been, you know, very, uh, you know, ahead of its time, I guess you can yes, say with women's absolutely. wrestling division. So it is something that I think would be incredibly awesome. Um, One of the things that Impact Wrestling and Scott Demore, especially Scott Demore, now that he's, you know, sort of taken, uh, sort of taken the reins of Impact wrestling one of the things that he has really been uh successful at is building and establishing these relationships with other promotions one of which is new japan pro wrestling so i do want to know like once you know japan starts to you know with covid restrictions start to lighten up and you know travels a lot more easier uh, is that something that you would be interested in in terms of like using the forbidden door to maybe go back to japan and you know do some stuff there on top of you know what you're doing with impact of course, I would absolutely love to. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of phenomenal talent. Some of the best wrestlers wrestle for uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. I would also love to go back to DDT whenever that's possible. I mean, I have I've made it my goal to wrestle absolutely everywhere. Um, I mean, not just geographically, but also in terms of promotion. And yes, I would love to step through that forbidden door uh, whenever I can. The forbidden door. It's so crazy how that's become like such a big topic, like especially right now in wrestling where everybody's like, who's going to show up where? What kind of dream matches are we going to have? And so I'm going to kind of segue into uh, 
one of the events that you were just at this past weekend, uh, PWG Battle of Los Angeles. I got to tell you, so I, you know, I'm from Los Angeles and I was so upset that I couldn't be at the show. And I texted my friend, a really good friend of mine, and uh, he was there at the show. And I asked him, I was like, dude, what matches stole the night? And one of the matches that he mentions was uh, your match with Bandito. And I was like, God damn it. I really would have wanted to see that match. Um, So like, I want to ask you, what was your experience like? Like, especially making it up, you know, to the finals, getting to see, uh, you know, Daniel Garcia essentially win the tournament. Uh, what was that whole experience like for you? PWG is uh, super special for, I mean, for, for everyone, but for me as well. Like, it's really uh, one of the places where I grew the most um, remembering matches that I had in 20. Uh, 15, I think, with guys like uh, Kenny Omega and Roderick Strong. And that match with Kenny Omega was really one of the many moments in my career where I was like, oh boy, there is so much I haven't figured out yet about myself as a wrestler and pro wrestling as a whole. And just the way his brain worked at the time was completely amazing. And I was like, okay, I have to go and do that, right? Um, same thing for guys like like Roderick Strong that I wrestled there were absolutely amazing. Chris Hero, so many like world class pro wrestlers that I got the chance to work with when I definitely was not at that point yet, not on their level. And it's still like it bothers me so much. It like as time went on, it bothered me more and more. But when people in over the last few years would say things like, "Oh my God, I saw your match with Roderick Strong. That was my favorite Speedball Mike Bailey match." And I always want to say, well, there have been five years of increasingly better speedball Mike Bailey matches like after that one that, that you should see. I mean, that was those matches were a very, very long time ago, and I've gotten a lot better since. Uh, I've like pre-pandemic, my my best matches are, you know, some of them in England, most of them in DDT. But to finally be back at PWG and get to to show people this is what speedball mike bailey can do now this is the new more polished version and i want you guys to remember this and forget about the uh the the you know young unpolished kid who got his ass beat by by roderick strong and remember uh who i am now and to get to do that with bandito in my first match back who is uh he and i had had another fantastic match in germany in 2020, right before the pandemic, as part of their 16 character tournament, um, he is absolutely one of the best wrestlers in the world. Easily, it's no secret. Everyone knows by now. He's been on top of Ring of Honor. He's one of the most popular and hottest wrestlers in Mexico. And the fact that I got to share the ring with him and show everyone just how much I'd grown over the last six years just meant the world. And I'd be lying if I said that. I hadn't been looking forward to that moment specifically for six years at home. Just every time I had a good match, just knowing, okay, this is kind of building towards that. Of and, course. Uh, yeah. Oh my God, that's so cool. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because it, it is true. Like, you know, a, a, you know, we as humans, like we we grow all the time, right? We change, we evolve, but that's just like from a person standpoint, right? From like who you are as a person. But talking about like the in-ring standpoint, obviously, uh, you're going to see these growth, you're going to see these changes, you know, in performers as they uh, you know evolve. Uh so with that being said, you know, you you mentioned like you you're wanting to prove people or not prove people wrong necessarily, but show them what you can do now like show them the the advanced version of you right now so i do want to ask you during that time period that you're wrestling you know in ddt in europe and rep pro and all of that good stuff what would you say was really the um the cause for this massive growth in you as a professional wrestler i mean I don't think that so there isn't like a fire or like there isn't I don't have the chip of my shoulder. I, I'm nothing but, you know, grateful. I like even talking about how how frustrating it is that, you know, I was unable to enter the United States. It's it's always been hard to complain about anything. Um, it's more of a quest for growth. My biggest accomplishment in life is that I've been happier than the previous year for every year of my life. And I mean, I, I'm happy that I'm able to keep that going. 
Uh, I Every time I look at matches of my own or just look at myself six months ago, I always notice how better I am now and how much my wrestling has grown, especially in the details. And I think that any pro wrestler who is able to look at matches of their own that are like a year older and be like, oh, yeah, this is good. This is good. Everything's fine. I think they're doing something wrong. I mean, I think you you need to you you know you need to have that that desire for improvement and that's that's part of my my quest as a professional wrestler and as a human is just to constantly get better and i take a lot of pride in being somewhat successful at that and of to course. you know finally get to show it means a lot and like uh that's the thing too like for you like what would you say is like the biggest difference and I know that's hard to say because I'm sure it's a bunch of different stuff but what would you say is like the biggest difference in terms of like from you like from the last time for example that you were at PWG to now like as a performer like what do you feel that you like bring differently to the ring that you probably didn't you know back in the day when you were just you know getting there so it's really an understanding of professional wrestling and if we're going to nerd out on it it's uh, mo mostly match structure and understanding of how to put together a match and tell a comprehensive story and all that um i have done a lot of teaching i've done seminars around the world for at least two years i was a coach at the idbs wrestling school in montreal and i've taught a couple people to wrestle you know, from the ground up me and the the other coach there shane hawk um and in teaching professional wrestling it helped me to understand it a lot better like what makes a match interesting how to make a match interesting and not in a like instinctual way but in a very like calculated almost algebraic kind of way to make sure that there's progression and everything is exciting and i've worked on specific aspects of my wrestling uh over the last like over the last years Two things that I've focused on over the last like two, three years. One, my finishing sequences and really making sure that the tempo of the match becomes higher and peaks around the end. And then the other one is active breaks versus passive, passive breaks, which is, you know, taking a rest while keeping the action going, which is something that I've really, really worked hard on. And I feel like makes a difference in my matches in terms of avoiding just, you know, both wrestlers being down as much as possible and not getting tired, but also keeping it exciting constantly. So that's, I know that's like very technical stuff. Oh, I but, love it. Yeah. I yeah. live for this stuff. Like hearing <laughs> you talk about it, I'm like, yeah, yeah, keep going. <laughs> no, but it's yeah. good stuff. Um, going to Japan again was a, was a huge part of that and how much attention there is over there to matchmaking and the details is, is amazing. And to be able to like, take that and transmit it in other parts parts of the world meant, you know, in order to transmit it, I have to understand it. In order to share it, I have to really be able to explain it well. And by explaining it well, you understand it even more is really, I think, what made a difference in my wrestling. Is there anybody that either maybe helped guide you while you were down there or maybe somebody that you just started studying a little bit more uh, that you kind of want to, you know, mention in this interview in terms of like somebody that you're like, Oh, I really got down and like started looking at this person's matches or, you know, like someone that maybe gave you a little bit of advice. There's so th there's too many to name. However, like great minds that I can think of that I've wrestled. Uh, this is way before Japan, but uh, Kevin, Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens is someone with whom I had a lot of matches and like way before Kenny Omega. That was someone that when I wrestled for the first time, I was really like, OK, this guy understands wrestling at an absolute other level. And I need to be able to catch up with that. But, you know, guys like Kenny Omega and Michael Elgin uh, were really people that really understood understood professional wrestling. Uh, Chris Hero as well, a guy that understood it super well. Um, but really, so in Japan, it's hard to date people because there's such a communal effort from the whole locker room to understand matches and study each other. And everyone understands everyone else's method, if that makes sense. And so when they're putting matches together, it's really, it's it's a it's a kind of different aspect. It's not me telling you what I'm doing, but us working together because we know something that is the biggest difference between Japanese wrestling and you know uh, wrestling in America is that when you wrestle in Japan, if you start with a promotion, you're most likely going to be with them for your whole career, right? So right. You have people that have like worked together three times a weekend for the last. 10 15 years and they they grew together they're really they have they've come to share a vision of wrestling 
that is like really the same. They're heading into the same direction. There's, there's no clash of styles and there's a complete understanding of exactly what we're trying to do together that just makes things so much easier in terms of telling a detailed layer complex story that the audience will be able to understand that is so cool and so fascinating to me and i was so happy that you mentioned that because i was just about to ask you like you know what's like the biggest difference you know from wrestling here in the u.s north america etc uh, obviously you know canada and mexico and all those places still very different from one another and so i can't really kind of bundle them all up there uh but like you know in comparison to Japan. And I'm so glad that you brought that up as well. Uh, and I, I feel like in terms of, you know, we mentioned Canada and Mexico, uh, do you kind of want to like pro point out some of like the differences, like in comparison to like the U S and Japan? So yes, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Cause that's one of my favorite topics in professional wrestling, as well as one of the things that I learned the most through traveling pro wrestling. Um, in order to have like a successful performance, you need to understand the context, right? Why you're doing what you're doing, why you're wrestling a certain way. And I think that uh, pretty much all wrestling exists on a spectrum between Japan and Mexico. Where in Mexico, the the way it is, mo mostly, like, of course, there are always exceptions and it's just some place in Mexico. It's, oh, the Lucha's in town. Let's go. Let's watch it. Let's get drunk. And so they don't really care unless someone in a like bright, brightly colored costume is doing a, a, a double backflip off the top rope, they're not really paying attention, right? Whereas in Japan, when I wrestled for DDT, you had the same 50, 75, 100 uh, audience members at every single show, no matter where in Japan. So in Japan, if you did like little details, like if you try a move, uh, like every match for a month, and then you finally hit it, the people really pay attention. They understand what you're doing. because They, they catch on to that stuff. Yes. In Mexico, there is no chance they would have any idea what you're doing. Which comes to things like uh, things like finishers. I think the finisher is a good example of that. Um, when I wrestle uh, for indie shows in England, for example, the audience kind of knows, kind of pays attention, but it's a small percentage. And there's so many awesome matches on an absolutely stacked show. There's no way that they'll be able to remember what moves I do. So if someone kicks out of my finisher, it honestly does not matter because the next time I come to wrestle for, let's say, a uh, title in Leeds, they will have absolutely no memory of what the guy they saw a month ago's finisher is. They, they, you know, they, they have jobs, they have lives, they're not <laughs> paying attention to what my moves are. But in Japan, people are paying attention. People know, people remember there are magazines covering it and you're wrestling a lot more frequently. So it becomes a lot more easy for people to pay attention and keep track of the stories and the evolutions of the moves of the wrestlers. So, I mean, understanding that is a, is a big thing is a big part of wrestling success. And it's like, there's a reason Lucha is the way it is. There's a reason it's, it's, you know, it's flashy. It's mostly a lot of it's unrealistic but that's fine because it doesn't need to be realistic to be successful. It needs to be impressive and it needs to be good lucha and good lucha is what it is for a very specific reason. That is so fascinating, man. Like just like hearing all of like these different things, especially from your firsthand experience, somebody who's, you know, lived through it and has done it. It's kind of cool because I feel like I almost feel it's a bigger challenge when you're in Japan and, you know, you know that the people are paying attention to those little details and you want to make sure like, hey, I'm, I want like I know you're paying attention. Like, here's what I'm doing. And also kind of, you know, kind of having fun with them on your own in terms of like what you portray in the ring itself. So, uh, it, it, it's it feels more challenging but also in a little bit uh more so more rewarding yes that's absolutely correct it's uh rewarding i think is the perfect word to describe what it is to have an audience that pays pays attention and understands like the small 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 details behind what you're doing is really uh one of my favorite like japan is easily one of my favorite places to wrestle for that exact reason Oh, amazing. Uh, Mike, so first of all, I, I feel like we can talk about this forever and we can go on and on about different subjects. Uh, however, I am going to go ahead and jump in from our interview portion onto our lightning round portion, which is totally opposite of what we were just doing right now. But I'm going to ask you 10 questions about yourself and you just go ahead and answer them. Uh, this is my favorite way for, you know, the people <clears> watching <throat> to get to know you uh, as a person and who you are, you know, outside of the wrestling ring. So let's go Go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, here we go. Question number one. Who are your top three 
all time favorite wrestlers. Okay. Uh, Tiger Mask one, Satoru Sayama, uh, Kenny Omega, and Will Ospreay. I love it. I love it. I love it. Question number two. Um, what's the coolest city you have ever wrestled in and a city you would like to wrestle in? Uh, I have wrestled. So Tokyo is the, the coolest city. I think it's the best city for professional wrestling. It's for a reason. It's the city that has like probably the most pro wrestling shows on a daily basis. Um, I would love to wrestle in Moscow. I'd love to wrestle in Russia. I think Russia is a place that will have a booming wrestling scene sometime soon but doesn't quite yet and uh it i know there's interest for wrestling there and it looks fascinating oh it sounds fascinating i hope that does you know blow up uh number three what is the best canadian snack or restaurant that you don't see here in the united states okay so i could talk about putsin forever and the rules behind it and what make it putsin because it's only three ingredients it's french fries gravy and curtis but it's so easy to mess up in fact, I know this because that was a topic of conversation this weekend. If you go on Google image and put in Putsin, 90% of the images you see on the first page are not Putsin. What? Um, yeah, it's, they're not. I'm sorry. Uh, if you have like, yeah. that's, a, <laughs> that's another 30-minute conversation. But yeah, uh, all as well, All Dressed Ruffles, the legendary All Dressed Ruffles, which I'm sure you've heard about. I have actually, yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, the best chips in the world, the best snack. I mean, never had them, but I have seen like people talk about it, but I've never had, I've never experienced them. <laughs> there, there's, there's hype for a reason. It's not, it's not just hype. It's not just a, a myth or something. They're really the best, the best potato chip flavor. Interesting. All right. Question number four. If someone could play the movie of your life, who would it, who would you want it to be? I would want it to be animated and oh, I would yeah. have to, I would want my character to be voiced by Joe Para. Oh, okay. Okay. If, if you don't know who Joe Perry is, please YouTube him. He's known for a very specific voice, but I would want it to be animated and voiced by Joe Perry. Is it like a deep voice, uh, like squeaky voice? Uh... It's a very soothing grandpa-like voice. Mm, very like ASMR sort of thing calms you down, yes. relaxes yes. you. Exactly. Okay. Question number five. What are some of your hobbies aside from wrestling? I love to cook. I went to a cooking school right out of the high school. Um, I love to eat and I love to cook. I am fascinated by, by, by food. I didn't work as a, as a cook or chef for very, very long, uh, only a couple months, but I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, cooking for myself though. It's nothing fancy. It's mostly like sort of diet food, but diet food that fits what I want it to be, but is also very delicious. Um, along that same line, I am obsessed with knives. I love a good knife, a good cooking knife, a good chef knife, as well as sharpening them. And I, it is a very speedball Mike Bailey thing to do to go to someone's house, let's say a friend or something, and complain that they don't have any sharp knives and then tell them what knives to buy. I love this. Okay, so like if you were to come to my house, you'd be so mad because I'm terrified of knives. Like I hate seeing them. And so like I like every time like my fiance, like he's the one who does the cooking. And when he has the knives like and he washes it and he, you know, leaves it out to dry. I'm like, oh, my God, please put the knife away. Like I can't even look at it. It drives me nuts. Well, yeah, you can't leave it out to dry. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed oh. to just wipe it clean. So that's number one. Okay. Um, Mistake number one. <laughs> One of the first things they t they taught us in cooking school was if you drop a knife, do not try and catch it. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that definitely makes sense. <laughs> um, question number six. Do you collect anything? I do not. I don't collect anything. I don't understand collecting anything. I, uh... <sighs> Mostly a minimalist in terms of like having possessions. I don't like I don't like having things. Uh, my, my fiance and I don't, don't like barely give each other like physical presents ever, because if we like need something, we buy it. I much prefer to spend my money on experiences like food or trips or something like that. Yeah. Adventures. Great stuff. Question number seven. Do you have a pre-match or post-match ritual? Absolutely not. Once again, uh, way too, uh, not cynical. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, I'm forgetting the word here. Not cynical. St uh, are you? Oh, um, You're no, I, I think I know. You've got so, it. It's not, it's, uh, superstitious. Superstitious? The no? Complete opposite of superstitious. Oh. <laughs> not superstitious. 
at all. Um, my, like my pre-match ritual is visualizing the match and going through it in my head and trying to imagine everything that could go wrong. And I don't understand. I cannot relate to the people that like put headphones on and listen to music to like calculated. Get in- You're a little bit more calculated. Ridiculously calculated to a. Fault. There you go. Um, I am going through the match in my head. I am visualizing it. I'm also like making sure I'm hydrated and making sure everything's in place. And post match rituals is just try to go over the match and think of what I could have done better in order to not repeat the same mistakes next time. And like that's the extent of it. There's no like, there's no fun little, you know, ritual or touching a certain object or anything like that. Question number eight, favorite Japanese dish? Ramen. Ramen. Specifically, okay. uh, tantan men from, which is a spicy ramen from a restaurant called Nakiryu, which is one of the two Michelin starred ramen restaurants in Japan, uh, both of which are delicious. However, the tantan men from Nakiryu absolutely stands out. Sounds delicious. Question yeah, number nine. Uh, do you remember the last thing you ordered online? Yes, and I have it right next to me. <laughs> uh, brand new batch of stickers, Speedball Bike Bailey stickers, <laughs> that I will be able to sell at my next show. Oh, they are so nice. I love like the reflection because it kind of looks like yeah, you can see yeah, like a little bit of a rainbow. Oh, second, oh, they're holographic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. Okay, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, and question number 10. What's the uh, last question? Uh, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? <sighs> that's a hard question. Check my phone. I look at my phone. And I. this is one of the worst things I do. And it completely leads to me hating myself, which is just I'll look at my messages. I'll take care of what's important. And then I'll go on Instagram. And then I'll watch, like, videos of monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and just scroll through like video videos of noodle soup and monkeys, martial arts and wrestling are like what's on my Instagram search thing. And I'll just get sucked in and like there's a new monkey screaming or doing something silly. And I just look at it and then I sometimes waste 30 minutes or so and I hate myself for it. It's the worst habit. But at the same time, like I get it because you could probably have done something like productive, right? Like you think like I could have been productive during these 30 minutes, but you got to sometimes just let loose and relax. Like that, at least that's what I tell myself, you know, right. when you get sucked into the Internet. It's so easy. But I know I know like that those apps, they're, they're, they're designed to do that. They're designed to get you sucked TikTok. in and look at. That's what it's there for. It'll suck you in for hours. And it's great. Nothing against like the like. The, the 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 platform itself however is just uh it's it's a it's my own failure it's my own lack of discipline <laughs> that lets myself get sucked in and watch those little entertaining shorts for up to 30 minutes and that's why we're seeing them everywhere now like that's why you're seeing all the instagram reels and everything because everybody's trying to capitalize on like you know what tiktok was doing with that so it is interesting to see I've tried to spread myself out on like different platforms. TikTok is the one that I'm struggling with because I'm not I'm not interested in the content really. So I'm going to have to for- force myself to find something to put out on there. But uh, yeah, it's difficult. I have a secret for you and the secret say you won't get sucked in and so that you can still grow on TikTok uh-huh, is uh-huh. don't look at your home page. Just go on, post a video and get out. Like literally, that's what I do. I post the videos and I get out. Because then That's you get sucked in. To do. That's what I've been um, trying to do. But <laughs> so I, I feel like for inspiration and to see what's good and what works and what's pleasant to watch on TikTok, I would have to look at. Like YouTube is easy. I watch a ton of YouTube videos. I watch a like there's a ton of creators that I follow closely and I'm like, okay, I like this content. I really enjoy this video. Can I do something like it? And then I try to do it on TikTok. That is really not possible because I don't have any access to monkeys. <laughs> that's true that's true although you did have access to monkeys you'd if have i had a, a monkey popular... i would be all over TikTok. yes you'd be doing like all these like you could do like wrestling moves with monkeys and you would be like millions of followers so i once listened to a podcast with a, a monkey expert on it and what they said about owning a monkey and that's why i'll never own a monkey uh, which i don't need to explain of course i never own a monkey but owning a monkey is like having a baby that will never grow up and can kill you at any time. Okay, yeah, that's terrible. Don't get no, a monkey. No pet monkeys. If you're listening to this, don't get a pet monkey. 
do not do not um oh my god all right well mike thank you so much i think we had an absolute blast here talking today about wrestling monkeys and food and all of that good stuff uh before we go please feel please let the people know where they can follow you on social media where they can catch you etc I am at Speedball Bailey on Twitter and Instagram. Those are kind of the two main hubs. If not, I'm on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Speedball Bailey. If you want to come with me and watch some wrestling, I do so every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Um, there are also other streams sporadically. I'm trying to grow my YouTube channel, which has vlogs, Q&As, and other fun stuff. Uh, Speedball Mike Bailey on YouTube. But if you would really like to help out, uh, please just go on YouTube, put in Speedball Mike Bailey. Watch some of the matches. If you see some matches that you like, share them with your friends and let them know. Also, most importantly, I'm fighting the Bullet Club on uh, Impact on Access TV this Thursday. I don't know when this will come out. Hopefully it won't have happened. But if it did, you can still go and seek it out. So please do. All righty. Awesome. Well, I'm going to post all of the links to that in the description box below as always. So make sure you guys go give Mike some love. Uh, check out some of his stuff. Again, links in the description box below. But other than that, we will see you guys next time. Do not forget to give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys later. Bye, everybody.